when we were praying, we were speaking in tongues, and there was a real strong presence in our, in our prayer time. And as I had my head down, I saw coming up from the ground a, a spinal column. And I didn't know what it meant at the time, but I prayed into it. I knew it's the Lord was saying, you're going to need a strong backbone as you're coming into this new year. But it also reminded me of Jacob's Ladder. So as I looked it up, one, one version where you see the stairway, they were comparing it to the DNA spiral. And, and they were making that comparison of between heaven and earth, God, we're created in God's image, and, and that open heaven above us. And the other one on the other side, the blue one, is more a stairway, you know, going up and down for the angels to go up and down. But, but mine was like a ladder where they were climbing up each side of the, up and down really, each side of the spinal column. And that's the double part of this is that the spirit has to operate with the truth. Yeah. And, and the picture is this. Um, and I don't know if you know who these people are, but I put their names up there for you. And it's, it's war movies. For me, I've always been a good analogy of spiritual warfare, right? And, you know, if you're in a Christian version that says there's no such thing as spiritual warfare, you're definitely in the wrong church, <laughs> okay? <laughs> because we, we can tell you pretty much where to look in the Bible if you don't believe it. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5 is a good place to start. The book of Ephesians 5 and 6 is a really good place to start. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Okay, if that doesn't tell you about spiritual warfare. and The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the demolishing of strongholds. So these are three different movies. The two characters that are on the same side is Desmond Doss from Hacksaw Ridge and Marcus Luttrell from the movie Lone Survivor. And I don't know the man's name on, on the side that says Saving Private Ryan, but I've never forgotten the scene of him being frozen in fear at the bottom of the stairs. And uh, it's a very profound thing that we're not mocking, but he froze in fear. And somebody died on his team, even though he had the gun. And he couldn't walk up the stairs and help his friend, and his friend got killed. And then the German soldier that killed his friend walked down and walked right past him, even though he had a gun. And it was even more of a statement of shame that I'm not worried about you. You had the gun, didn't use it. I don't even need to kill you. Wow. Oh. Oh, wow. Who wants to be that guy? I don't want to be that guy when I stand before the Lord. And I met Marcus Luttrell at a, at a meeting because my last company I worked for, they could see that I had done a few meetings in my life, <laughs> not knowing that it was from all the church meetings that I've done. And, uh, you know, to run a corporate meeting is much easier than to run a church when you, you know, for 10 years we set up and broke down every week in a high school auditorium. So, you know, these people in corporate America don't even know how good they have it. But they would ask me to get involved, and I, I welcomed him as the guest speaker to one of these big events. And it was a beautiful you know, no, they don't spare any expenses when they hold these meetings. Right. Beautiful corporate uh, park that we were in. No, but hotel, beautiful hotel, but it was very corporate. And, and I'm one of the hosts there, so I'm supposed to welcome the speakers that are coming. And he walks into this big ballroom, and he's got a golden retriever next to him. And he's a big guy. He's 6'5", bigger than me. And I'm thinking, what's a dog doing here? I, I didn't know anything about his story. I've come to find out that he was still suffering from post-traumatic stress. And the dog was there to help him, that if he got triggered in the PTSD, he could have been walking outside and a car could backfire, and he's brought back into the battlefield from hearing that sound. And yet he's here to speak to us. Amen. <laughs> See, the courage. Wow. If anybody could fold, he could have folded and say, oh, no, I'm not strong enough to speak. But even in a broken condition, you could argue, you know, he's not fully healed the way we would understand healing. He still spoke for an hour, not a dry eye in the room, not a peep out of the, out of the crowd while he was speaking. And when I shook his hand, I really felt like something happened. <laughs> it was like you're in the presence of a really brave warrior. And it's almost like a throwback to a different time. In high school, he and his twin brother were being groomed by his father to go into the Navy SEALs. He's 6'5", 240 pounds. The average SEAL is 5'9", 160. 
So it's even harder to get into the seals if you're that big because they spend so much time underwater that it gets in the way. Your muscle and your bones get in the way. Both of them made it into the seals. And I don't know if you know much of the story. I'm, I'm not going to go into the whole story, but I can tell you there was an anointing in the room of courage. And we all felt it. And you knew you should honor veterans. <laughs> can we just say that, church? We need to honor the veterans. We need to honor the police officers. They're not all bad. I know there's some bad ones, but they're not all bad. They're risking their life. When did that go south? That we disrespect the people that are willing to die. This guy wanted to still be in the seal. He couldn't. He had 300 deployments. 20 different broken bones. Had been shot in five, six different times. I don't even remember all the statistics. You get the point. He couldn't do it anymore. He physically couldn't do it without getting a miracle healing. But he never stopped telling the story of what it was like. And the whole thing about his story was you never quit. No matter how bad it looks, you never quit. And the whole thing of going through SEAL training is to see who's willing to quit. You know what it means, ring the bell? At any time in that hell week, they can ring the bell and that means they're gone. But if you make it through, everybody else on your team knows you're all in and you're not going to quit. That's for the church. That's why I feel the Lord has shown me this, is this double backbone. And, that, and you could look at it in, in the message version in John chapter 4. I'm guessing you all know the story of the woman at the well, which is behind me on that stained glass. It's from John chapter 4. It's a really extended, beautiful, long story of how Jesus meets this woman at the well, and he has a prophetic word for her. And it's a beautiful interaction that's part of the lesson that I'm going to try to convey today because we're interacting with people all the time and they're at different stages in their knowledge of God, their willingness to even want to know God, but does God want to speak through us to that person? Yes. Every one of them, he wants us to speak to them. He wants us to open our mouth and let him speak through us. So this is what he said to her about worship. In the, again, it's a message, and it's not the full 21 through 24, but this part, these parts are taken from those verses. You worship guessing in the dark. <laughs> she was Samaritan, right? And they didn't worship the same way the Jews did. We Jews worship in the clear light of day, but the time is coming. It has, in fact, come when what you are called will not matter. It's who you are and the way you live that count before God. We could spend the day on that, couldn't we? It's not what you're called, and how would that translate into 2021 in America is, yes, I'm an Italian-American, but I'm a Christian before I'm an Italian-American, or before I'm black or white or Native American or whatever. I have my identity this way, as a child of God. <laughs> so when Joan Hunter was here, she talked about the song, No Longer Slaves to Fear, I am a child of God. That was Jonathan Helser. Go, go watch the video. It's on, our, it's on our YouTube channel. I keep talking about it. But what she said in six minutes gives you the backstory of that song. He said, when I was in my mother's womb, you have chosen me, not knowing that his mother was supposed to get a hysterectomy right before she gave birth to him. But a prophet came to her and the husband and said, don't abort this baby. He's going to be a prophet and he's going to sing worship songs that are going to go all around the world. He wrote that not knowing that. From my mother's womb you have chosen me. Love has called my name. Yeah, I'll tell you what. So it's not, this is so important, isn't it? It's, but the time is coming that it's not what you're called that will matter. It's who you are and the way you live. And we lost that vision corporately, I think, in the American church to just be, church is this nice little thing that I do on Sunday and I check in, and then I go live my life during the week, and then I come back and check in. And, and God is saying, you know, you, you're far underestimating what I want to do and be for you in your life. I want you to be my child. I want you to reflect the glory of God into the marketplace. And he says, your worship must engage your spirit in the pursuit of truth. All right, now we know that in other versions he said, the Father is seeking those who will worship him. Come on. Spirit. And in truth, even if you're mumbling, say, we're in truth. <laughs> I can't wait till we lose these masks. Yeah. Oh. Please, Lord, no more delay. 
So the Father is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. That's the oil and the hammer, if you want to look at it that way. The word can be a hammer, and it's referred to that way. But Jesus made it clear that there's a way to deliver the word where you can have oil on it. And, and that's what he did with this woman, this Samaritan woman, right? Because let's just say he knew when he first met her that she was living deep in sin, right? If he was real religious and legalistic, he would have been hammering her. You better change. If you die in this condition, you're going to burn in hell. It's not what he said. He met her where she was. I have living water. She had had five husbands and is now living with another one. She was trying to quench her thirst in a relationship with a man. Jesus is saying, no, I have better water. You drink what I give you, you'll never be thirsty again. Big difference when you live that way. And we know she went on to be a great uh, evangelist. Another day's story. So I don't want to be the missing backbone guy who's frozen at the bottom of the stairs while my friend is being killed upstairs. I want to be a combination. Now, again, you might have seen De uh, Desmond Doss in Hacksaw Ridge. It's a pretty bloody movie. It's made by Mel Gibson. I think he, if I ever get to meet him, I'll say you didn't have to make it as violent as you did. But he didn't ask me. He didn't call me before he made the movie. It's a war movie, and it's very violent. But this is a true story of a Christian man. He was a Seventh-day Adventist, right? But that's still you know, a, pretty, a Christian denomination that doesn't line up exactly with what we believe, but he was he's holding the Bible. You can barely see it in that picture, but that scene is near the mid to the end of the story where he comes in and they're beating him up because he won't carry a weapon. So nobody on his team wants him with them because they're afraid if you're out on the battlefield with us and you don't, you're refusing to take a gun, then you're going to put us at risk. And he wins them over, not because he's preaching at them, because of his courage. And he can't really see it in this picture, but in this picture, he's praying with the Bible in his hand, and his hands are all wrapped because the night before, he had saved 75 soldiers off the battlefield. He was running into the battle, finding the wounded guys while the warfare is going on around him, dragging them to the edge of a cliff and letting them down by a rope, and his hands were getting shredded by the rope. And as his, he's leaning back in the movie, he says, one more, Lord, show me one more. Amen. Ho! Talk about courage. Yeah. He even brought two Japanese soldiers. Wow. And, and the medics wouldn't take care of them. I know. Think of that. Whatever. Another day's topic. He, he didn't force his faith on anybody. He lived it. That's the spirit side. Marcus Luttrell was more the hammer. Okay? He was shooting people. He was killing the enemy. He wouldn't quit. Two different examples of courage that we have to understand. Sometimes I think the church has been too passive, too much on the sidelines. Don't talk about that. Don't ruffle anybody's feathers. We need a little more Marcus Luttrell. We need a little more lone survivor. I'm never going to quit. But we also need Desmond Doss. That's the double backbone who's going to take the persecution and still not fight back and win them by our testimony. That's a good combination, but it's not easy. 